everyone. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Carlos. I'm originally from Ecuador uh, with an upbringing in the US. I have a bachelor's degree in linguistics and architecture and a joint master's degree in France, Italy, and Spain, speak six languages. And I did my traineeship uh, in Luxembourg in DigiConnect. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. Great. Thank you. And what about you, Isabel? Well, thank you very much and welcome everyone too. Um, well, I'm Spanish. Um, I studied translation and interpreting. My, my background is a bit peculiar, so I did translation and interpreting um, to become an interpreter. I was I didn't in the end, uh, so I joined a master's degree on European law, and then I did another one on European governance, and I studied my Blue Book trainship, the pandemic trainship in 2020. Uh, I say pandemic because it was a year instead of five months because we went into lockdown, so that was, that was a bit it. Um, and then uh, I stayed as a policy assistant in my unit, and then I moved in May to become a press officer in the spokesperson service of the commission. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Isabel. Let's then start. Uh, regarding um, the next steps, okay, so first of all, I would like to ask Carlos, uh, before going to the, to the application form, I would like to ask you how was your experience in Luxembourg, because I, I know that some people are quite afraid of um, applying or accepting opportunities in Luxembourg because uh, they are afraid because it's, it's expensive, which is, it is, of course, but I know that you are a very good experience. What can you say about that? Okay, so I, if I had to choose one word to say, uh, to, to summarize my experience in Luxembourg, I would say that, uh, it would be family. Um, in, uh, in Brussels, there are a lot of, around like 700, 800 trainees, and most of them know it themselves. But in Luxembourg, it's like as no one wants to go, it's actually much better because actually we, are, we were, in my session, we were 42. And I would say that we became a family. I mean, we went everywhere together. We made a lot of events. We made a lot of like uh, trips and we, we did lots of like uh, gone outs and hikings and tours and parties. And, and at the end, it was really, really sad um, to leave because uh, it was a, a, an amazing experience. The country is super small. Uh, it has a lot of advantages regarding transportation. I don't know if you know, but uh, Luxembourg is, uh, has uh, a free transport everywhere, trains, buses, everything. Then you're really next to Germany, France, and, and Belgium, which basically allows you to uh, rent a room there if you cannot uh, afford it in, in Luxembourg, which was my case, actually. I, I lived in Ireland. And um, it's only 20 minutes by train, so it's no problem, actually. And um, as, as it is really small and it's really great, um, the sense of uh, union is quite strong. So I would think twice before rejecting a, a traineeship offer in Luxembourg or in any other delegation. Uh, there will be many of you maybe rented one opportunity in Barso or in Paris or in Lisbon or in, even in Vigo. So take it. <laughs> That's great, Carlos. Thank you. Uh, before starting, I would like to, um, to know where are you watching us from? I know that I talked to many of you um, on LinkedIn and I know that you come from different um, backgrounds. So if you want to, you can leave it on, on the chat. Uh, it will be very nice to, to know where are you currently. Um, also, I wanted uh, to tell you that, um, okay, sorry, sorry about this. Okay, I wanted to tell you that uh, we are going also to record uh, this, like, like I was saying, um, we will upload it to the YouTube because I'm, I'm reading here that we have some issues regarding uh, the audio. Um, it's not easy to hear what I'm, what I'm reading here. So do not worry if you're hearing this in, in YouTube because uh, we will uh, get to edit a very good quality um, of this presentation. Well, I see that we have many people from different parts. Belgium, Spain, Greece, England, uh, Greece, France, Italy, great. More Greece, France, Belgium, Zaragoza, it's very international too. Okay, Croatia, Granada, Brussels, Brighton, Slovenia, well, that's great. Um, I'm talking to you uh, from uh, Coimbra, in Portugal, uh, where we have one of our headquarters, JEPSO. Um, Carlos and Isabel. Hey, Carlos, where, where are you talking from? Seville, Spain, south of Spain. Ah, 
Okay, that's that's very nice. So you're enjoying your vacation there. And you, Isabel? I'm in Brussels. In Brussels, nice and sunny, isn't it? That's always. It's actually very sunny. We're having a good summer, so I'm not going to complain. <laughs> okay, that's that's great. Well, I'm going to share my screen now because we are going to start with the application form. I'm going to share it here. So I hope that you can see my screen. If you can confirm, I will be very grateful. Um, also, if you can also turn on your camera so that we can see your faces, it's more friendly also for us. And like I, I, I told you already, uh, we are not going to share your image on the on the YouTube. So basically, this is the website that I hope every one of you have already visited. Because if not, we are not starting with the with the right foot. Um, basically, this is a traineeship. Web's, uh, web's website of the Blue Book Trainships program. Here you can find a lot of information, very useful one. You have the home, you have about, about trainingship, all the information that you need. Um, also, how to apply. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here talking to you about um, the different bureaucratic um, steps that you need to take into account. You have also legal information. Um, most of all, and this is one of the most valuable tools that you have at your disposal. It's the frequently asked questions where you can find almost everything that you know. Um, and I'm quite sure that even that we are going to give you some subjective information during this workshop. Mainly, we are basing our, um, our sources in this very um, same website. So you can find everything, almost everything here. We're going to give it to you in a more structured way, so it's easier for you to follow, but basically it's everything here. You can uh, find the answers to the most useful questions like how much are you going to earn if you manage to be um, a Blue Book trainee, basically. Well, being said this, uh, basically what you need to do once you are starting, it's going on the apply or check or check your application basically you will find here um your your data basically this is public so it doesn't matter if you have my my cell phone once you manage to do like your account and you validate your information you are going to go to this website when you can choose between chosen uh admin traineeship or uh digital general uh, translator. Uh, so basically, if you're a translator or you're interested in it, you can choose this um, this opportunity. But also, I mean that uh, most of you probably are thinking about the general one. This is the one that we are going to go through it together. Um, the application form looks like this, as a menu over here with a lot of information that they ask. First of all, you will find your personal data. I'm not going to tell you about your personal data, of course, um, but I'm going to tell you, first of all, that um, it's very important to keep in mind that once you have submitted the form, you are not going to be able to change it. So before sending, validating the application form, you need to be quite sure about the information you are sending. This also is happening um, well, of course, that Isabel is going to reinforce this, but this is this also applies for the supporting documents. So once you send everything, you will not be able to um, to change anything or to uh, send other supporting documents. So basically, applying for the Blue Book traineeship it's about organization. Um, first of all, you should have all the um, information. Uh, very close to you, basically, because uh, even if you are not successful the first time that uh, you send your application, because this is something that you need to take into account. A lot of people apply for this opportunity, many, many people. I'm talking about thousands of people. Um, and sometimes your profile at, at the point you're applying is not the best because basically um, it may happen that you only have your bachelor's degree and nothing else, or you have not any proof of your um, competency on the languages or whatever, you may not make it on the first time. 
maybe, nor in the second, nor in the third. I'm not telling you this so that uh, I bring you down. It's basically about reality. Um, being successful in the in these traineeships, um, it's quite difficult, and sometimes it's about um, maintaining your effort, like um, directing all your will. Um, sometimes it's just about hanging out there, <laughs> and finally uh, you you are successful. And at some point, I'm pretty sure that all of you will will be successful, but well, you have to try a lot sometimes. Basically, um, about the application form, like I said, name, uh, it's very important, the um, nationality, the citizenship, basically, because the selection process is not, um, you are not competing against other nationalities. You are basically competing somehow about other nationals from your uh, member states. So, or from your country, basically. So if you are from a country that sends a lot of applications, it's going to be a little bit tougher that it's, you are only competing. I mean, you are from another country, I don't know, Pakistan, maybe it's easier for you in in the pool. But um, this is a very important one. Um, my suggestion for people with two nationalities will be to try to think about or at least see the stats from the European Commission showing the people who were in previous editions so that you can choose the nationality that suits you better. Basically, the ones that according to the nationality, the applications and the number of inhabitants, it's, it's better for you, basically. Well, you have the gender, date of birth, country of birth, place of birth, and basically it's something that of course, uh, you you know better than anyone else. Regarding eligibility, okay, this is probably one of the most important sections that uh, you will face during the application form. Basically, um, you need to be honest, not only with the European Commission, but also with yourself. This is quite important because if you do not have eligibility to apply for the Blue Book Trainship, okay, it's better that you take your time and maybe you apply for the next, next opportunity. Um, but it's very good even for you to have a clear that you can apply. And um, for doing this, you need to have a full university degree of at least three years of duration. This means that you need to have your, um, you, you need to have finished your bachelor before the deadline of application before the end of this month. Basically, if you are planning to have your degree in in fall, for example, you cannot apply right now, but you will be able to do it on the next application uh, period. This is important to keep in mind, okay? If you do not have, for example, the diploma, it doesn't matter as long as you have a proof, an official proof from the university saying that you already finished your, um, your university degree. Then you need to have a proof of a C1 or 2 or C2 level of one of the three working languages of the European Commission. And then we're talking here about English, French, or German. And um, you need to keep this in mind because uh, we are going to talk a little bit further about that. Uh, Carlos will do it, um, about how to prove your knowledge in, on the languages. But it's something that you need to have if you don't have it, when the different people, the different evaluators who will um, examine your will examine your uh, application don't don't see them, well, you will not have chances to continue. Okay. Also, you need to fulfill the eligibility requirement, which is not having worked in the European institutions for more than forty-two days. This is basically why I couldn't apply for the Blue Book Trainship because I first worked um, and my contract was related to the European Commission, so I couldn't apply for it later. Um, basically, um, it's something that you need to keep, to keep in mind because after you finish your Blue Book Trainship, your time in the European Commission, it is true that you can apply for other agencies, but it doesn't work the other way around. So basically, if you have like more than 42 days 
of uh, trainees, if, for example, in Europol, uh, you cannot apply for the European institutions. Even that, once you finished your time at the European Commission, you can apply for Europol um, doing two traineeships in European institutions or bodies or agencies. Okay. And finally, you also said that um, you declared that the information that you are providing is accurate. In this sense, I have to say that, uh, again, I need to reinforce this, that you need to have proof of everything. And you will find on the frequently asked questions section of the website, which are exactly the requirements, even that we are going to tell you a little bit more about the different requirements today. Um, what happens if, for example, you miss one, um, for example, the C1 level of one of the three official languages, the working languages, okay, you are out. Um, they are not going to think too much about this. If you do not, by any chance, for example, the PDF you are sending, you are missing one document, you are not going to have the, the chance to send it again. Um, Isabel and Carlos were already evaluators in the, in the Blue Book traineeship um, review, and they can tell you a little bit more about this. Okay, let's jump then to another part of the application form, and let's go with education. Um, in this particular part, I think Carlos, you're going to be the one talking about it. If I if yeah. I'm right, okay. Yeah. So whenever you're ready. Okay, so uh, just uh, two points about uh, the previous part, the personal data. One uh, thing super important. The the first one is uh, names and surnames should be exactly as your identification number as the one that you are going to put in the application. That's really important. Okay. Uh, don't worry about accents, but but write everything as it is, because if not, then it makes confusion, and you need to make the, the job of the evaluators really easy, okay? That's number one. And number two, be really careful with your uh, with the birth date. So write exactly your birth date. If not, then um, it's gonna be you're gonna be rejected as well, because you need to be the, 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 the person that you're saying that you are, okay? Um, about the the application, uh, I met a girl at uh, the Fervo conference in Brussels in June that she applied eight times until she was accepted. There's also people like uh, Isabel and I the first time, so anything can happen, but she didn't she didn't stop, you know, so she continued. So that's the message I want to send regarding that part of the don't don't feel it down if the, something that does not happen the first time. Okay, and then uh, regarding nationalities, what Carlos was saying, uh, in my case, I also have two and I applied uh, to Spanish and that's, uh, that's why I thought it would be much much easier, you know, Spanish uh, to EU members should say. If you want to uh, know about more about uh, facts and figures or statistics, uh, write in internet blue book, blue book traineeship facts and figures, and you will see all that. Okay, so that's on, the, on that part on education. So the the must, let's say, that what you need to have and what you need to prove is that you need to have a bachelor's degree. Bachelor's degree is a bit confusing in some states because we all have different things, even though we have Bologna. But um, you need to bear in mind that uh, a degree considered for the traineeship is a full completed degree. What does this mean? That, for example, in France, uh, bachelor's degrees are three years. Uh, I don't know, but Italy and Spain are four years. So you can say, OK, I have already 180 ECTS, which is our credits. Can I apply? No, because in Spain, it's not considered that you have finished until you have had the 240. OK, so this is really important. As Carlos said, you do not have to have the physical document that says that you have your degree, but you should have a completion of the diploma document. So it's a word document or something that the university gives you saying you have finished everything, you have the 280 uh, ECTs for Spain or 180 ECTs for the other member states. And so you have your degree, you have, you have, you're waiting for your original diploma to be delivered. Okay, that is uh, important. And another thing important about education is that um they in the in the in the application form you can see here that for example uh you have how many um qualifications would you like to declare so my advice i don't know if isabel agrees declare um, degrees that you have first of all completed so if you don't have any any degrees com not completed don't put them or put them as an extra information or i'm currently studying this etc okay then type of qualification, in type of qualification, you can choose between bachelors, double bachelors, masters, double masters. So if you have a double master or the degree in Spain or any other place, you can you can put it as well, okay? What's EQF? EQF is basically the levels of education in Europe. So to standardize, to homogenize everything. So as a, as a sum up, bachelor's degree in the whole Europe are EQF six, 
okay? A master's degree are EQ, EQF seven. If you have a PhD, it's eight. So you should put it there, okay? Um, then you put your university name, your the country, uh, the field of study, so architecture, urbanism, technology, IT, whatever you have studied. And specialization, I would like to stress that you should put the most important um, subjects, the most important skills that you have had in this and this qualification. Yeah, for example, in my case, I studied architecture. So what I wrote was uh, architecture, um, BIM, which is basically uh, construction by digital, um, statistics, um, I don't know, yeah, calculus, etc. cetera. So um, you, there's a really extensive uh, part for the education, so you can go as long as you want, but my advice would be be really concrete, be really precise in the whole application and write, I don't know, 10 keywords at, at least uh, or, or, or tops, uh, because the, the, important, the importance is that the, the evaluators can read in, in a, at a glance or really quickly everything that you have that you have written and then they can choose you okay so be really concise be really brief be specific but also highlight things that you consider that are, that could be relevant to boost your profile okay then um, special, um start date and end date okay. this is really 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 important I, I don't I, I when I finish I would like Isabel to to go on everything that I have said so that she can reinforce stress or say anything on her experience because it's really confusing if you put if you have one degree that has one date and then you write another degree with another date it's really confusing for the person who's evaluating so this is really important maybe the start date it's not uh, clear because it's not in a degree but the end date must be the same okay so check two three four five times i printed mine I, I i put the application on one side i put the degrees on the other and i was like you know going from upwards downwards and uh, controlling that everything was the same because things that you will not put um, that are correct it will be confusing or it, they, they, the evaluator can say okay this is not matching this is false okay which is not the case because we know that you're honest but be really be really thorough in that part okay and then ECTS as I said bachelor's 180 um, in Spain 240 I don't know any other countries you can put uh, for this we can we can put you some links later and um, and uh, yeah masters uh, so masters are also 300 depends and then in comments you can put anything that you can uh, that you deem uh, important or interesting about your about your your bachelor's your, you can say that you have attended three different universities and that you have done uh, one year in English one year in, in Spanish or whatever for example in my case when I put when I was speaking about the master's degree my master's degree is joint which means that it was uh, the result of three different universities so I put in the comments I put really briefly I put uh, uh, first year University of Seville in Spain, so in Spanish in brackets, so that it's very clear that it was in Spanish. And then I put uh, university in France, blah, blah, blah. And then I put France in, it taught in French, or fully taught in French, something like that. And then in, in, in Italy. So in my case, I put all the three universities. I put uh, the languages because I knew that the languages are something really important. And uh, aside from that, uh, in the part of the, of the competencies or, the, or the, the comments, I put all the, the most important skills or the most important subjects uh, from each uh, degree. So I think that's the that's the, the important thing about this part of the, the formal education. Okay, then in informal uh, education, informal education is every degree that is not that has not been delivered by a uh, um, by university, let's say in general. Okay, let's sum it up that way. For example, uh, I have a degree from uh, the UK, which is basically uh, allows me to teach English worldwide, which is called CELTA, Certificate in English Teaching, whatever. This degree, uh, it's uh, an EQF5. So I said it's an EQ, an EQ5, an EQF5, sorry, I cannot put it as a formal, but as an informal. So it's an education, you have done it, you have attended it, it's two years, for example, in France, the Brevet. Yeah, it's a typical example. In, in France, there are a lot of different degrees which are not licence, which are not bachelor's degree, that you can put here. Okay, so if you think that this is, is important, that this is, could be interesting, you can, you should, you should put it here. Okay, remember also the EQF and uh, no, no ECTS, but um, it's important to put like take it into account. So you put there. Um, how, how many would you like to declare? I think it was until uh, I don't have it here. Yeah, up until up on five. Yeah, so formal degrees uh, four. Informal degrees five. You can you can you can say it until up until five informal degrees, and you can put them. Um, then uh, what is the what is certification? What is the name of certification? 
then what is the what is the organization? What is the the, the, the place where you where you got it? In my case, it would be Cambridge uh, English Assessment. Then the country, uh, and then you put the issue date. Again, the issue date must be the same as the information stated on the certificate. Any kind of document that you have, it should be the same. Okay, it doesn't matter if you finished after, if you finished before. What's in the paper, you have to put in the application. Okay, don't don't overcomplicate yourself uh, in your life. And that's it on my side, Isabel. I would I would love to listen to your remarks or your experiences on that later or something you would like to say about education. Thank you, Carlos. No, I think you explained it very well. So for me, we can go and directly go to professional experiences. If that's okay. Yes, just something, Isabel. Sorry, <laughs> if you have nothing to say, I, I would like to stress again that the encoding dates must match exactly the exact days. The exact dates sorry it's something that this year it's completely required so if you send one date on the application form and then you have another date on the on the documents you're not going to make it so it's very important that you keep this in mind uh, also i left the eqf uh, level on the chat so you can you can check it um, it's very important information that it's in the bottom and basically the ones that talks about the uh, BA, it's basically level five, master, uh, second level is uh, level six, um, PhD, it's basically uh, the next level. Um, finally, it's also important to tell you that uh, if possible, you should uh, send the Europass Diplomat Supplement, which is basically, I don't know, uh, what's the exact name? Um, but in Spanish, as we have a wide audience who speaks Spanish, uh, it is like a supplement Europeo al título. It's like the European supplement, or something like that, that they call, or university trans transcripts. Okay, so keep this in mind because it's quite important. Sorry, Isabel. Yeah, actually, I'm I'm going to do a follow up because Patricia is asking, and I actually um, I am not sure it's as strict as you said carlos um the thing is not to create or make up the month you know where you were granted your 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 diploma because this is an important thing for example in my case i finished in june my degree but my diploma was given to me in september but it's true that i did everything from my thesis to everything so i basically finalized it in june so what it said in the diploma is that I finalized it in June. So you put June. If if you can say I did it on the 15th of June, it's OK. I mean, no one is going to really go into the day, you know, so don't don't panic about it. Of course, if you say I finalized my diploma, my my degree in June or July and then the the certificate says October, then there is something to be checked. But you can actually actually say it in the comments. So you could say, I do not remember the exact uh, day, but the month is this one, and this is what it's going to appear on my on my uh, diploma. You know, so so don't panic about that. Um, <laughs> no, it's fine. It's just that I, I know that they might be a bit stressed <laughs> and worried because many things have changed in this last uh, years. So I, you know, it's it's maybe better to to just. Uh, do that so if, if if you want we can jump into professional experience um one point that i wanted to clarify to you guys um is that in case you want to do several trainships which is this is the case you can okay so if, if you go upper there you go um you can do two different trainships in european institutions the thing is that you cannot do some simultaneous ones or in some institutions. What I mean is, for example, imagine that you want to, to do a trainship in the commission. It is very important that you haven't worked in any other institution or body for more than 42 days. But for example, if you wanted to do a trainship in the European Central Bank, you could have done another full trainship in another institution. For example, imagine that you want to do the Blue Book or you go into the council or you are a Schumann trainee and then you want to go into the ECB, you can do it. You, you can do it. There are some institutions that allow you to do a trainship with them, even if you have done another one in the bodies. But that is something that you will see in each in its experience. But just for you to know, in case you're stressed about what's coming after the Blue Book, that you have some possibilities in this regard with, uh, with uh, the ECB, for example, or working for a 
for a deputy in the European Parliament. So you can work for, for an MP uh, working as a trainee after your Blue Book trainship. So, you know, in this case, um, you can do it. So one thing that is very different from what um, was the application form some years ago and some months ago, actually, I think this is the first time they do, um, is that you can include the voluntary work activities in NGOs and political parties, as well as unpaid internships as professional experience. Uh, when I applied, this was not the case. So, you know, I know that um, for people who, who study in, in normally in, pol in policy or law or all the related topics like for international relations, it's very common to do things at the same time. And this counts as professional experience for the Blue Book. So, you know, just include it as, as what you have done in the past and that's it. So if you go into the the professional experience and I don't want I don't want to maybe keep you too long in this because I think that um, it's not really necessary, but you can tell me afterwards. As Carlos, Carlos and Carlos said, <laughs> the duration needs to be exact from to, again, mind the month, okay? Do not stress on the day and the year, it's very important. The occupation or position held. This is important that you don't make it up, uh, which means that if you were a trainee uh, working on project management, you cannot say that you were a project manager. You were a trainee in project management. Okay, this is important. The employment type, uh, you can select which employment type you, you did. So this could be again like trainee or, you know, voluntary or whichever you, you went for. On the organization company, of course, the name of your organization and company, location, the country. If you go down a bit, please, um, so they can see the and this is the most important one, um, because in my experience as, se well, when selecting trainees uh, for my services, um, for me, the most important part was the main activities and responsibilities, because um, put yourself into the position of someone that is going to hire you. Imagine that you like, uh, I don't know, communication in this case, okay? When you work in communication, there are certain skills that are very important. Um, and when you are doing this, you might think, oh, well, but if I say that I was a content creator in the occupation or position held, then it's very obvious what I did. Well, it's not uh, because you could have been in many different areas covering many different topics. So my recommendation is to put all of that in main activities and responsibilities. Do not leave everything, anything out, because when they are going to select it, they are going to check this. And for us, it was it was it was what made us select a trainee. I'm just going to say it like the ones that really prove what they did and that we knew they were good on this. And then we had the interviews with them and we could actually ask them about these activities. Those were the ones that for me had the most quality. Um, but of course, this is up to you, but I, I would recommend doing this. So we can go into the next one. Carlos, uh, do you want to add anything else? Well, it's linked to the, the next part, uh, which is international experience. So it's okay. I, I, can, I can just like couple it. Um, something that you should bear in mind, uh, some people might ask themselves, okay, I have been working or I have been a volunteer at some NGOs or whatever, uh, how, what is the minimum amount counted to be, um, to, to, to state it as a, as a, as a professional experience. So, uh, the, if you, re, if you check the FAQ, it says 15 days. So everything that you have done more than 15 days or 15 days minimum, um, is considered professional experience as a volunteer or anything. So you should bear that in mind. And, um, so uh, you can declare up to five experiences uh, in, the, in the, the previous one, the one that Isabel has spoken. What, it, what the application says is that they consider national experience related to your nationality, to declare nationality. So if you, for example, in my case, I worked in, uh, in Ecuador before being Spanish. So if I were to do the traineeship now, I should put, for example, I am Spanish and I should put in the national, in the, the one that Isabel has just spoken about, I should put my experience in Spain because that's related to nationality. And here in international experience, I would put the experience that I did in Ecuador. Okay, so that's that's something that you should bear in mind because you, some of you people who have two nationalities may be confused about this part. So that's something that you can that you can uh, take into account. So um, regarding international experience, it's basically summarizing the same that Isabel has uh, just said. You can also um, you can also state up to five um, experiences. In uh, in my case, as I just said, I didn't. I did some. Uh, I had some experience in Ecuador. Had some experience in uh, in Italy as a as a trainee in my this is the end of my my master's. 
I had some experience with Czech Republic, and right now in Luxembourg. So I would put, if I were to do the, the traineeship, the, this application now, I would put all this, this experience here. So uh, you, can, you can decide on how many are you going to declare. The, the thing is that remember that you should have any, um, for everything that you declare, you should have a document already, because we're already in a, within a week of the, of the submission of the application. So anything that you can get from here to Friday or from here to Monday, maybe you can, you can ask your previous um, um, you know, advisors or, 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 or bosses or something and you can ask them. Um, something that you should include in your work certificate if you don't have them already is on my, on my view, I don't know, Isabel's view. My view is that you should have the, the, the initial date, the ending date, if possible, how many hours you work per week, so 25 or part-time or full-time or something, that's important. But the document should be signed, should be stamped, and should be, um, should be dated as well. So issued on August, I don't know, this year, and then uh, stamped. It can be digital. I, I think it must, it must be uh, much, much easier if you have it digital. Okay, so uh, I think that's something important. And I would say that you should pay attention also to the dates that you put in the application that matches the, the ones that you have in your, in your work certificate. I don't know if this is also flexible, so I said regarding education. Um, when I was briefed, I was uh, a little briefed on, on, you know, they need to match. If they don't match, then, <laughs> then it's like, the, uh, some people say, I don't know, as an example, some people say, I have been working for five months at a company. And then their certificate says two. So that is something, I would, I would put two only, you know, and, and uh, not risk it because maybe you don't know, but maybe it depends on flexibility on this state, maybe it depends on the assessors. So maybe an assessor is super strict, maybe another assessor is less strict, let's say, not, not, not strict at all. So um, this is something that you should uh, pay attention. Isabel was mentioning, I don't know if you heard her, but uh, she was mentioning some skills. She said, this is a really important skills in communication. So skills is something that is really highlighted here. So I would, um, I don't know if I put it already, but I would, I, there's something that is called uh, occupational skills. And this is occupational skills. There is a website on the, on the European Commission. You can put European Commission occupational skills. And you will have there a lot of like, uh, I don't know, arch architecture or, or communicator or social media manager, whatever. You choose the profile and you will see all the skills that the European Commission lists as relevant or important related to the position. So my advice would be when filling this part, when filling all the part of the, of the specific, uh, um, I don't know, skills acquired, you can go to this side and you can select the ones that match you. Because as Carlos and Isabel said, you should be honest. So you said, I am not going to say that I'm something that I'm not because on the first week of your tradition, you're going to have a hard time. So it's important that to be um, honest in this part. Uh, then uh, for, future, for the future, I would just say that uh, everything, every paper that you get right now for this application, scan it, store it, because it will be useful for you in the future. And I don't know if uh, Isabel wants to add something on Carlos. Isabel, do you want to say anything regarding this? Actually, I would just recommend that no matter what international experience you had, please include that you're, one of the skills that you have gained was working with people from abroad. Because imagine, I mean, you're going to work in an institution where 20 other, 27 other nationalities are going to work with you. Um, and this is your reality in your position, and they're going to very appreciate if you put it, um, it in case it's true, of course, which I think it is. Um, but but do not forget to add it, because again, this is something that you think it's very obvious, but it's not. So just, just include it. Great, thank you, Isabel. Um, I would like only to reinforce something that, as Carlos and Isabel said, you have up to five work experiences. I'm going a little bit back. Um, so choose very well the ones that you want to include. Basically, Carlos also gave a very good tip regarding the international ones, because maybe um, you have one experience. For example, I was some months uh, in Nicaragua working in a project. It was not exactly working experience. It was through the university. But uh, it's something that I would not use because I, I have other professional experiences and I will bring two international ones. At the end of the day, you think that um, imagined that they are giving some points regarding the different sections. Try to balance all of them. Try to make at least to get the best out of this section. OK, um, regarding the professional experience, they suggest to start with the longest ones. So try to keep this order if possible. 
Um, they do not say anything regarding the international experiences and, and the time you are taking them, but um, I also would suggest to follow the, the same, starting with the longest one and going to the, to the short one. Um, okay, so I do not have anything else to add. So Carlos, I don't know if you want to continue with languages, a field in which you are quite a good expert. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So, okay, uh, regarding languages, I'm going to say something in really all modesty, and I don't, I don't want anyone to take it as uh, if they don't have, my, let's say, profile, they cannot apply, whatever, because it's not, that's not true. Um, just uh, as Abel also said, uh, atypical. We are two atypical uh, profile trainees with different uh, uh, assets and different things. So I think that uh, that's something I should, I should say. So if you can scroll down, Carlos, a bit. Languages, yeah, thank you. So. If you read all the all the all the all the part in the beginning, basically the summarization uh, is that um, you should you can declare up to six languages. Okay, it says seven, so don't don't believe the, the application because it's it's wrong. So the application you can put uh, five plus your native language, so it's six. Okay, so don't get confused on that part. Don't worry about that part. Just put the languages that you know. Um, so you can declare six, but if you speak more than six, you can also comment them at the end. Okay, you can put okay, like I also speak Chinese at an, an A1 level or something like that. Okay, so let's go part by part. So um, the first question: Are you from the mem for one of the member states? Why is this question important? Because for EU member state uh, citizens, there's a required requirement of two languages. They have to speak either English, French, or German at a C level. So the 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 traineeship's office considers a proficient level uh, C1 and C2. So this is this is something that I would like to clarify for people who have had I don't know the the, the, the proficiency exam in, in in English, and they say okay I don't have a proficient level because I don't have a C2. No, the if you read really well the FAQs in one of them, it's really stated uh, the the commission considers a proficient level C level. So basically it means C1 or C2. So if you have any of these two, you have a proficient level for the commission. Okay. So this is something that I think it's important to clarify because a lot of people, I think a lot of people um, read something or hear something and they're like, okay, I cannot apply. No, read everything, go through the whole thing. And then when you have the whole picture and, and asking, looking for different uh, questions, then you might know. So uh, if you are from a member state, you should speak either English, French, or German at a C uh, level. So C1, C2 and another level. Yeah, so another another um, another another language, let's say. If you are not from a member state, you can only speak one. So you can uh, it has to be English, French, or German. Okay, also at a C level. For DGT candidates, people who are going to buy uh, have, have, are going to choose the second part, not not administrator. It's the same thing plus your native language. Okay, so your native language is called source language. And the other two languages are called target languages because these are the two ones and the ones that you are going to apply. And you have to have one of them. So English, French, or German should be a C level. And the other language, so it would be, I don't know, Hungarian or Latvian or whatever, um, it should be at least on a B2 level. Okay. This is regarding uh, C levels and B levels. Okay. Then uh, you should also, as Carlos said, that from the longest to the shortest in, uh, in, um, in, in professional experience, in languages, you should put the strongest to the least strong, let's say, not to the weak. <laughs> okay, so you should you should put first your 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 native language, and then you should put English, and then you should put all the other levels that you that you have. Okay, so you have their global scale. Global scale, you have the levels that we have been speaking about. Then uh, you should choose from reading, from speaking, and from writing each one of them. Okay, then um, you have their uh, language too. So you choose your second language, and you do the same. You put global scale. And then um, you can also put more languages than the two languages required. So I, I would say that the more languages that you that you put, the better. But it's really important to consider that, um, as, as before, everything that you declare, you need to prove it, OK? There's a lot of um, confusion around languages regarding uh, how to actually confirm it. So I'm going to try my best to, to speak from my experience and to speak from what I've seen. And of course, I, Isabel and Carlos are more than invited to correct me or tell me, no, that's not that's not true or whatever. So um, a language uh, a language proficient level cannot only be attested or ascertained by having an official um, document from a school of languages like Goethe or like Cambridge or anything. That you, you can say, okay, I speak uh, German at a very good level, but I don't have a good certificate. Uh, that means I cannot put German. No, you could if 
you have either completed uh, your studies in, in German, you have done an Erasmus in, in, in Germany or in German, it doesn't have to be German, it could be Austria, it can be any other country, but it should be something, let's say, official. That, that has to be something uh, issued by a competent entity, let's say, okay? So like language, school of languages, for example, I don't know, Cervantes in, in Spain, um, uh, uh, Dante Alighieri in Italian, uh, or chill certificate or whatever, okay? So uh, they should be issued by either um, uh, uh, an official, a certain language student center, yeah? So not the, let's say, not the academy around the corner. <laughs> I don't want to be mean, but uh, you, you can say, okay, so if I ask the certificate of attendance at one of the academies, can I prove that I have a beach in French? No, okay? So this, this is something that is really written in a lot of parts in the in the FAQs in the from the traineeship's office. So certificates of attendance are not considered a certificate of a language, okay? So something that has been issued from a university, from a language uh, course, from uh, experiences abroad, um, et cetera. Then something that is also not considered as a language certificate is recommendation, um, recommendation letters from, from teachers, okay? So for your teacher from high school, from teacher from university or something like that. Okay, if you have studied, uh, I don't know, linguistics and, and English, of course, you can, and, and you have their French as well, then of course you have, you are, you are um, assessing that you speak French as well. Okay, so um, the university courses, I may allow to read one thing that I have here written, uh, university courses uh, can be partially or wholly taught in a language. So that's something that you should aim for in order to um, prove that you speak the language. Okay. And um, anything, the uh, last thing, uh, anything that you prove that you speak of a B1 level, so if you put B1, you should have this document. And everything that you put is a, a, an A2 level, it can be something a little, a little less formal, let's say, but it should be also asserted from an official entity. I don't know if Isabel has more information on this or some, has seen something on her experience or Carlos. Sorry, I was answering actually <laughs> comments. <laughs> Yeah, in my case, uh, Carlos, thank you. I have not anything else to, to add. Um, so, Isabel, if you have not anything else also? Maybe... No, I would, I would yeah. maybe just uh, like a recommendation for people who are looking into going into certain um, DGs. Just to bear in mind that even though like you know the european union has 24 languages and then we have the working languages which is what they call uh german english and and french okay so normally we we work in english okay um but it's true that depending on where you're going to be you're going to need the rest of the languages for example if you work in the legal services or if you work in the spokesperson service you're going to need french um maybe not as perfect as english but it's going to be a, a good attribution so why do i say this if for example you see that you're very strong in english but you're not so strong in french maybe have this in mind when applying because you have three opportunities to apply to dgs as you we will tell you later so you know bear this in mind because maybe you are applying to the legal services to a very specific one that actually deals with uh the um, Court of Justice, and they need someone with French, and you have an A2 or a B1. Bear this in mind, because maybe an, an, a stronger candidate with a C1 or a C2 level in French would be a better fit for that position. Which doesn't mean that you're not good at you're not a good fit, but maybe not for that unit. Okay, so just bear this in mind. Thank you, Isabel. That was a very good tip. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, let's continue then. Um... I'm going to share again my screen. Okay, so I think you should be able to uh, see it again. So uh, we are now in another section, a new one. Um, it's a section that it was not uh, previously included in the in the other editions of the Blue Book Trainships. This is basically soft skills. Um, basically, here you have the chance to select up to three soft skills um, to tell a little bit more about your uh, professional personality, uh, kind of, um, so that you can send a message of the kind of person that you are while you are working, or at least your mission, your values, your core values, basically, it's what uh, they want to know. Um, I would like to stress here again, because uh, I said it, um, in the beginning of this presentation, I think so, 
um, that uh, we are not giving official information. Isabel, Carlos, and me, we are giving personal opinions regarding the Blue Book trainships. Um, nor Isabel, Carlos are representing the European Commission, and even me, I'm not representing the EPSO, even that we're using the facilities. Um, I'm telling you this because, of course, you should go to the official sources to verify everything that we are saying. Okay, so this uh, a small disclaimer. Something else that I would like to to highlight is the fact that when you are applying for the European Commission, it's something that you should keep also in mind when you are applying for other professional opportunities. Is thinking that you are applying, but they are not. Um, making you a favor selecting you you need to be competitive and you need to um, be persuasive during the process so try to keep in mind um, the best way to um, to sell somehow uh, your profile uh, trying to highlight that you are one of the best possible candidates that um, they can select and um, in these soft skills, this is quite quite important because, like I said, you can choose up to three, and you have different kinds of communication, teamwork, leadership, emotional intelligence, uh, mindset, professionalism. Um, you need to choose three of these. Um, you need also to say which of the different elements um, do you think that. Um, exemplifies better the kind of person that that you are okay um, and finally here you need to justify why you chose for example professionalism and commitment teamwork and multicultural mindset and finally mindset um, eager to learn for example this is quite important try to do not uh, choose the skills which are already um chosen uh, previously for example if i choose teamwork um multicultural mindset maybe i would not choose mindset i would choose another one who can give an extra value an added value to my profile um which is important very important here is that you have many characters um almost half a million i'm not telling you to use it okay don't do it do not write more than you need and uh, this is a principle that you need also to keep in mind. But I really recommend you to um, justify very well why you have chosen professionalism and commitment. And I want to tell you also two tips that you may apply here. For one side, um, I will also tell you to check the EPSO competency framework, which are basically eight competences that uh, the EPSO, the European Personal Selection Office, take into account. Um, a new framework for 2023 was released um, a couple months ago. Um, maybe it's something that you want to check out because they are going very deep into the different competencies. I'm going to share with you after my intervention here, the link on the, um, on the chat. Um, but it's something that you can also bring to your um to your narrative when you justify why you choose one skill or the other um the best way as someone who is who is working in human resources regarding the european institutions is basically what i do i i read a lot of application forms a lot of uh, motivation letters i will also, also suggest you to explain why you choose your skills based on examples Okay, so this would be basically, um, I'm a very eager to learn people, for example. If you choose a mindset and eager to learn, you should, in my opinion, and this is my suggestion, to write an example of a situation in which you already showed that um, you have this skill. And I would use for this um, a methodology that it's usually used for interviews, which is like the STAR methodology. It's basically a start writing very short the situation in which you showed that um, you have this skill. For example, uh, this situation happened in uh, 2018, for example, 
um, this is the situation. I was working in, I don't know, I was working delivering pizzas, for example. It's the same, it's the first thing that came to my mind, okay? Then the task, which was your responsibility? My responsibility was like um, delivering the pizzas on time and I needed to keep in mind whatever. Then action, it's where exactly you, um, you develop the idea, the main idea, why you are eager to learn. And you think about something that um, it, was, it was key for your job and that shows that you are a very eager to learn person. Um, this should be also not too long, but it's the main part. And finally, you should also uh, reflect the main learning, uh, which in this experience of eager to learn, which was the main learning that you took from it um, and the results that you got. So this is a suggestion to sell your skills to pers to a little bit to be a little bit persuasive because if not you are going to be like the other ones like saying okay i'm let's say for example uh communication let's say that um i have a lot of experience uh, in public speaking because i already presented many times in the university i always I wanted to be the one who was giving the presentation, whatever. Try to, like I said, go a little bit outside the box and bring some examples that can give you an added value. You need to think a, bit, a little bit about this, but um, it's worth it, okay? Uh, later on, we have here the digital skills, and digital skills are also um, quite important because um, you, by selecting the ones that, of course, you master or that uh, you have some learning or some experiences. For example, in my case, um, and my background is related to law. Um, I'm a qualified lawyer, but even that, uh, I didn't work too much. For example, I have uh, knowledge and experience working with Premiere Pro, which is a software for editing videos basically because of my experience in, in tips, <laughs> this basically. Um, so it's something that, for example, can be a very nice added value to bring to the European Commission because maybe, I don't know, if I would do my trainships at, uh, I don't know, DJ environment, maybe they are working on some audiovisual stuff and it's something that uh, it's an added value to your profile. But also, for example, if you control Microsoft Suite, then you have to justify, of course, but uh, if you have some um, other softwares which are interesting to bring also here, you can also add them. Um, and of course, as many um, skills as you have, you should include them. And this can give you a very nice added value to your, to your profile. And here, as you can see, you have many different kinds of uh, skills that uh, you can talk about. Do not, um, do not forget any of them. Okay, and this was basically my presentation on skills. I think I talked too much. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, Isabel and Carlos. Uh, let's go then finalizing this um, application for with other achievements. Uh, I don't know, Isabel, if you can, if you want to give some advice regarding this part of the application form. Yes. yes. Thank you, Carlos. For other achievements, well, first, I'm glad to see that they have added some more characters <laughs> that we have, because I think we had 500 characters or something like that. It was ridiculous, to be honest, because we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't say anything. Uh, but this is very good, because, for example, when you're studying, you might, you know, write things or articles for associations or, you know, um, I don't know. You, you, you could be doing many things. In my case, for example, I was doing that. I was writing articles for an association, a youth association I was in. I had participated in debate clubs in, you know, many other types of, of activities that you do in university, which is actually very good when you when you join the commission because you then realize that this is very useful. And I, I, I didn't have back in the day a place to put it. So I think this is very good for you. Also for short term courses, uh, because, you know, any of the courses that you have done, um, for example, imagine that you you have gone to a 
summer school for European studies, you know, and then it's like a three or four day getaway and then you get a diploma, then you can add it here. Um, I would then again recommend to go straight to the point, you know, and just say, okay, I did this. Uh, do not beautify it. We call it in the commission. Do, do not beautify it, you know, do not add too many things to that. Just be clear. I did that. I did that. I did that. Problem like done. Um, and then if you want, we can go into, well, one thing about scholarship grants and awards. Um, I would say that you can add this in other achievements or in education, actually, because, for example, when I when I included my education, I remember for my degree, I was part of the. Uh, how is this called in English? In Spanish, we say Consejo de Estudiantes, which is like uh, the Council for Students, which makes no yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, so I was part of that, but I didn't want to occupy sp uh, the space in other achievements. So I just wrote it very briefly there uh, and that would be it um and then we go into attach files if that's okay this is the biggest change they have done and i think this is the biggest shock that um applicants who have done other tries uh in the past have found themselves with um in the past you did the application form you sent it and then you waited for around two months until they told you that they had pre-selected you but that you had to prove everything uh this time they are doing everything together which makes sense uh to be honest but i know that this is kind of a of a surprise for many of you in this case uh you have the attached files uh these are all the documents that justify everything we have told you up to now if you go into the trainship um website which i'm going to send you while we speak so you can have it um, there is a little tag saying you well telling you how you should provide the documents okay because it's it's actually important when when i did it we didn't have um any list on how we had to do it but apparently it had to be on the way it was requested so for example in i remember we had like five numbers and they asked us for for those five numbers in order in a single pdf so it's it's actually similar but they are telling you how so basically you have to add a table of contents okay showing the list of documents in the pdf point by point so you have to do an index basically you have to put a copy of a valid passport or identity card proving the nationality indicated in the application form as Carlos said, if you are Spanish and Italian and you are applying as an Italian, do not put the Spanish ID because then it's invalid. OK, you just put the Italian ID. Then you have to put all the copies of your university degrees. Um, in my case, I did it from the latest until the earliest. So basically um, what I did was putting my master's degree, master's degree, degree. Uh, but then I, it's not really specified so i think you can just do it as you please as, as you want and then uh a proof of a minimum uh european qualification framework uh which is the university degree and then the the proof of um uh sorry of uh, professional experience okay so you need to copy of proof of, of enrollment so this is the order i don't i am not going to tell table of content valid passports, all university degrees, okay? Uh, please ensure that the date of the graduation and final grades are indicated, okay? With a copy of proof of enrollment in current studies, if applicable, which is another novelty because I we didn't have that option back in the day. And then the copies of certifications, licenses obtained as indicated in the application form. Then copies of evidence of the work experience in your home country. OK, so this could include we had a question about this in the past letters of reference from an employer, you know, which should be duly signed, which is making it legal. OK, uh, dated and indicating the period of work, as we said, contracts or pay slips. OK, uh, also note that letters written on plain paper without a letterhead are not accepted as evidence because it cannot be you know, you cannot prove who wrote that and you cannot prove that actually that was written by someone in the company that had the power to hire you. OK, then copies of evidence of all international experience indicated in the application form. This might include, again, the letters of reference from employment, uh, an employer, the contracts and the pay slips. So the same as with the professional 
experience, okay? And then for experience of mobility abroad, uh, you might include the copies of the diplomas obtained abroad, Erasmus certificates, certificates from study exchanges programs, and certificates of volunteer work, okay? Um, again, for any of those, you cannot just put a plain paper without a letterhead. Oh? So just have in mind that this needs to be legally acceptable. Then you need to go into language skills, okay, declare in the application form. This may include certificate of languages courses, clearly indicating the level of knowledge achieved, issued by the language centers, for example, Instituto Cervantes, Alliance Francaise, a good institute, or a state recognized language schools issuing certified attestations, okay? Then, for example, the university course, as we said, if, for example, you have studied your degree in bilingual, um, so you, for example, in my case, I did it in English and German, so my German was justified by my degree, we could say. Uh, but if you have done a course and then you just have that you did a C1 level of um, Swedish, uh, but you don't have any certificate, that that's not valid, I'm afraid, okay? Then uh, we have the three last points um, is the for general skills, no certificate is required. So do not panic about this because there is no way that you can certify, you know, your skills. You will need to prove them in the interview, which we will talk about it um, in, a, in a minute. And then for numerical skills, there is no proof either, um, but it's only recommended, but you will see it in the application form again. And for the other achievements, it's not compulsory, but recommended, okay? So, which means, imagine that you did this course that I told you, the summer course about European uh, studies. So you attach the diploma that they gave you or the participation form that they gave you saying that you actually went and did those three things. And uh, yeah, normally we had actually, yeah, I can see the maximum file size. And this is something that you need to have in mind because you are going to suffer a bit with this is that it can only be 10K, okay? If it's above 10K, then you cannot have it. This is very important because um, in my case, I struggled a lot because there were many things that I wanted to, I wanted to testify and I wanted to certificate and I couldn't. Um, it, of course, it was more on the other achievements aside, but you know, in case you want it, just you have it there. Okay, thank you so much, Sabel. Um, Carlos, do you want to add anything? Make sure that your documents are um, straight because it's really, I don't know if Sabel's experience, but uh, as uh, you know, assessing, you have the 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 ID is completely upside down, or everything is. Uh, it's really really easy. You just put rotate <laughs> so that everything is super easy for the for the validator, and it does uh, important. That's one thing. The other thing is, do not make double information. It means like if you have your degree, do not put the degree and the supplement. And I mean the supplement's okay, but like I don't know seven times because actually that's gonna jeopardize you in the sense of what Isabel just talked about in the sense of the size because you have you will have I don't know like I don't know fifty documents and then you wanna put them all in that one giga and one mega it's impossible. So, and also something that they recommend is uh, do your scans in uh, black and white. I know I, I know I suffered because uh, I like everything in color. So let's see in PDF is nicer, but it's much better because you, you, you could tie it less. And also there are PDF compressors. You can put in, in the worst case scenario, PDF compressor, and then you put it there. So it's also uh, helpful, yeah. okay. But don't, don't sweat it out, huh? If your if your diplomas are not horizontal, huh? it's going to still be valid. It's just if you want to be nice to the evaluator, <laughs> you know, then just put it horizontal. If not, it's going to be fine. Yeah, I I just suffered because it took it took me a lot of like time, like, like turning the whole time. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. something like, yeah. Anyway, it's very nice to send the documents so that the evaluator is happy to see them. Okay, <laughs> think about that. Maybe the evaluator is getting your application form let's say on a Friday uh, afternoon after eating lunch um, in a, I don't know, I would say with not a lot of good weather for the weekend. So try to make their life brighter if possible. Okay, that's also- You'll probably be important. eating lunch while doing it. <laughs> Let me tell you. It's important, yes. Okay, so basically once you have finished this application form, do send. Okay, um, basically now we are going to keep going.
because Carlos is going to sum up a little bit the main information that we saw very, very quickly. And let's go to see what is happening after sending the application form. Um, while Carlos is doing this, I'm also going to tell you that um, this is the first time that the European Commission is having this new model of um, selection. So there are some information that we don't know yet, but um, we are going to try to anticipate a little bit about what is this uh, virtual blue book that the European Commission is it's talking about. And Carlos is going to talk a little bit more about what about this, um, um, the next steps. Also, keep in mind, please, if you are finally selected, please write us to tell us about your success because it's something really cool to know. We have so many success, successful uh, candidates already who saw our first edition. Carlos is one of them, for example, and we feel so happy about them. This is something that we do to try to help you, as I said. So it's always nice to get a little bit more about what's happening to you later on. Okay, Carlos, you are already set up. So. Yeah, so basically about about application form don't forget your data your your information uh, about uh, education remember about the the full degree that's a, that, that's the must and the, the the dates about professional experience no more than 42 days at the eu institutions and uh from longest to shortest remember you have the two kinds of uh, experience national and international and that your dates should coincide okay remember that uh it's also important then on uh, languages up to six, uh, accepted as proof, official languages, as Isabel said, state languages or university courses, partially wholly taught, okay? Not accepted certificates of attendance or recommendation letters of, for, uh, from teachers. And as Isabel said, on, on, on professional experience, uh, no plain papers, yeah? Linguistic profiles, if you're an EU candidate, you have to have uh, either English, French, or German at a C level, and then any other language. And if you're not from the EU, just one, okay? And for translators, this plus a uh, mother tongue. Then uh, application and, and soft skills, as Carlos said, uh, up to you can select up to three among all of this: communication, teamwork, leadership, etc. Then uh, choice uh, needs to be justified, and use concrete and illustrated examples, as Carlos uh, just mentioned. Uh, digital skills, the same. Yeah, this is an example. So for Office Word and IT web development, etc. So remember to always link uh, digital and uh, soft. Then, as Isabel said, applications, scholarships, awards, independent projects, publications, uh, if you're doing a PhD, and short-term courses. And finally, uh, the PDF, a single PDF, maximum 10K, uh, your documents, your degree, your experience, all evidence, all, and proof of languages, and advice, digital, and achievement certificates, if you have them. If you don't have them, no problem. And... Yeah, well, this is not something for me. <laughs> Just like, you know, the, the straight thing, be honest, as Carlos said as well, uh, declare information that you can prove, provide just one ID, as Isabel said, and uh, be succinct, be concrete, and check your spelling and tell yourself. Um, Isabel, do you Can need stop? some air conditioning over there? <laughs> because it's just about the... Very sorry, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm having a menopausic moment huh, in this case, <laughs> because I'm, not very, I'm a bit sick, I have to say. So it's oh. a bit warm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> no, no, no sorry, sorry to hear that. It's just that it happened the same to me. I have the door open and I think we are like 32 degrees in Coimbra right now. So I needed the air conditioning. I was just suffering for you. <laughs> well, um, we have finished then this uh, first part of the application form. Um, now let's talk a little bit about what, com what comes next regarding the uh, what the European Commission just said. Basically, what you need to know is that they are going to need around like 10, 12 weeks in order to evaluate all the candidates. There are so many candidates, so be patient about this. Um, then they are going to give you more information about. Basically, what the European Commission is saying is that they are going to give further information once that you are selected to be in the virtual blue book or something like that. So if you want to, uh, Carlos and Isabel, we can talk a little bit more about uh, the information that the European Commission gave. So Carlos, I know that uh, you are very well informed about this. I don't know if, <laughs> if you want to say something. Yeah, I, can, I can begin um, and then Isabel can also compliment on it with her wider view. Um, so basically um, uh, you will receive an email uh, from the traineeships office, the TO, 
this email is from your stash online account. So the stash online account is going to be your communication with the TO. Okay, so you will go there and you will see that you have uh, been uh, pre-selected, and then you will have up to you can apply up to uh, three positions, and these applications will be open for a week. After a week, the application will be closed. Okay, so you cannot apply anymore. So this is really important. Then uh, during uh, the following weeks, there are two weeks. Two weeks after this. Uh, services will basically select the most appropriate uh, suitable candidates from all the candidates who applied for them. Yeah. So, and then um, certain uh, commission departments might contact the, the candidates, or some some uh, cannot. Okay. So, and this can be followed afterwards by an informal interview. It could be a Skype or a call, a WhatsApp call in my case. But um, this is basically the the whole the first phase. I don't know if Isabel wants to say something on this first part because there comes an hour part afterwards. So, Carlos, uh, to lobby or not to lobby? <laughs> okay, this is a uh, for me. I'm a I'm four. Okay, I'm gonna try to make it super quick because people are, might be uh, really you know, tired of listening to us. So, in my case, I sent 288 emails. Okay, and the uh, thing is that I was really determined. I was pre-selected, so I was really determined to be in a commission. Even if that sounds really stubborn, but I just was my, my goal, my dream. And, uh, and Isabel had just inspired me so much with all of the things that she said. So it, I just needed to have it. Carlos, I don't know if we have lost you. The system blocked. A little bit. Well, um, until Carlos comes back, uh, I just want to say that until now, what's happened is that uh, you, you, sent, uh, you, you had to send, sorry, your application form they were going to evaluate that and after that they, they would tell you okay you can you are pre-selected or not pre-selected they would do the eligibility and after that it would be like a lobbying process some somehow let's say uh, a kind of lobbying where just needed to send so many emails um to get a position in the in, in one of the dgs previously in the application form uh, they requested to have like three selections. As you see, right now in the application form, we do not have these um, DGs uh, options. We do not have any motivation, and we cannot anticipate what uh, is going to happen with this um, virtual blue book. What we know until now, it's what Carlos said, that it's that um, you can select up to three um, DGs or, yeah, or bodies or whatever you can select and they are going to choose between them so it seems like and this is my opinion it's not anything official but it comes like a first come first served or something like that if you manage to send um, your application quickly uh, you can get to it in this particular case probably with some DGs this is going to be something difficult for example in DJ Impa where a lot of people send the, their application. It can be a competitive, a competitive advantage for other DGs where people usually don't send um, many applications. Um, and this, this is my uh, foresight to be said. Um, it's that it's not going to be easy in the sense that uh, you can only choose three options. Um, so not everyone is going to select almost mm -hmm. uh, everything um, and also the, the European institutions they are not forced to select between those 25 but the lobbying process it's going to be somehow different we cannot anticipate but what we can say is that once we get some information about it maybe we can do like a spin-off of this um, of this uh, workshop uh, Isabel thank you yeah, I just I just want to clarify something. Um, lobbying is never and has never been recommended officially. OK, um, this is something you need to have into account because this is not something you go into the website of the commission and they say, yeah, start loving everyone in the commission. No. Um, so my recommendation is they have changed completely the process in this regard. So don't go crazy um, because this is I'm afraid this is a bit of a pilot in this case, because as, as Carlos said, we do not really know how you're going to select now the trainees, um, because you are going to apply to three positions as long as soon as they have for one of the positions, 
more than 25 candidates or the 25 candidates, they are going to just delete the position from the system. So, you know, it's going to be a bit different. Of course, of course, you could lobby if you really like one unit um, and you have not applied to it, you could lobby, you could write to the head of unit or the deputy head of unit with the assistant in copy and say, hey, um, I am a perfect candidate. You put who you are, what you want to do, why you're interested in that unit, you attach your CV, and then you put your, your blue book number and then you send it. But first, first, because this is this is very important also for the respect of colleagues, okay? They are not compelled to read your emails and they are not compelled to reply to you because they receive many, many applications. They have no idea. So if you do not receive a reply from them, um, just, you know, it's not your problem. It's not because you did anything wrong. It's not, it's just maybe because they cannot, or I mean, it's nice. I, I loved that they replied to me, but if I'm honest, I sent like 70 emails back in the day and they replied from four or five, you know? So, you know, it's just take it easy and then don't put all your eggs in that basket, you know, just, you know, try to do it the way they tell you to, because at least it, it is a pilot, they are still checking how to do it, I would say. Um, I'm saying it not from the commission perspective, but from the perspective of someone who applied back in the day. But yeah, it's important to do a lobby. Okay, so just prepare. You don't need to attach your your Europass. Uh, your, <laughs> you can use your normal CV. Uh, don't stress about that. And then you can just send the emails to them. Um, the system that I used to use, if, if I may, Carlos, um, which was inherited from another trainee before me, um, was I created an email with just three brief paragraphs that were easy to read. In the first one, I introduced myself and I said why I was interested in that unit. You can find, if you go into the commission website and you go into the DGs and services, each one of those DGs and services have something called organigram, okay? In that organigram, you can see what units you have, who is the head of that unit, and what they work on okay so you can have that information there so then you just take that and you say okay i am interested in this unit in dg clima for example and i would like to apply what am i adding to the team because this is the most important thing you have to think that the blue book trainship is not going to be an, a normal trainship where you learn from scratch and everything they're going to give you work a lot of work from the beginning you know you're going to have responsibilities from the beginning so they need to know that you are capable of doing it um and then you just you know you put your candidate number if possibly if possibly um to in the in the subject of the email and then you uh attach your cv please make sure that your phone number is there because they are going to interview by phone <laughs> okay this is important some people don't put it because they think oh my my phone number is from cyprus how is yeah no roaming so you can you can call okay so it's fine just add it um i saw a question um on on the on the general emails i would not recommend um the general emails because thousands of people are going to write to those um if you happen to have the general email from a unit um, then you can do it i would not recommend either i what i did was to write to the heads of unit directly so you just go and, and look for the head of unit of the of the unit for the deputy because the heads of unit are always very busy and the deputies are always supporting them. So, you know, he or she will probably read you. And then my little trick is to put the assistant of the head of unit in copy because, you know, if the head of unit is not going to read you, then he or she will do. Um, and then you send it out and just wait for a reply. But please, oh, again, be always super polite. Be always aware that there are many hundreds of people doing the same and uh and and yeah so i don't know if, if carlos wants to add anything yeah so i fully agree it's true that you have one perspective as a future trainee and then you have another perspective as an insider let's say and so i completely agree with uh everything that you have uh, recommended i would say yeah like uh, don't really don't really write emails like uh, you know super long because we don't really have time or people the person who's going to read it that's, that's not that, that much time it's I, i'm i'm i know that we all want to say that we are have done a lot of amazing things but as isabel just said two mini paragraphs the first one two lines the second one two lines and the first one 
why are you interested in working in that unit and you have to show that you know about that unit so you're currently working in this project specific project and my background or my experience can benefit to this project because of blah 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 and then in the second in the second part uh, uh show yourself motivated show yourself interested so, so that show that you can have initiative and you can do things and you can say i don't know the first week there i would do this and that or whatever. I, I in my in mine I wrote that I if I speak six languages on a proficient level, I could definitely be a part of the multilingualism department. And that that's what my, my supervisor said that caught her attention and that, that I was you know replying the whole time. And so that's the way that you should a little bit you know summarize it, but really super, super concise and brief. And as I said, super polite as well. And even if they said no, sorry, we don't have uh, we don't have an opening for a trainee right now, reply. You can also reply say, yeah, thank you very much for your kind answer or whatever. I remember uh, having uh, sent some emails from from different people who, because of the reply, uh, and I was nice. They replied again. They said maybe they are looking for uh, trainees. Look here, you know. So that that really allowed me to continue and and continue lobbying. And uh, I know that maybe I was a spam of the European Commission back then, <laughs> but um, I I was I was you know, no I I didn't want it to feel that I had, as I said, uh, that I had done something wrong, you know, because I, I actually, I actually, I actually was not selected uh, when everyone else was. And, and I, I remember writing to Isabel saying, hey, I, I, I maybe I'm not, not making it. And she was like, don't despair, don't lose hope, just, just, just go on, just focus yourself, just continue and not, not loving, but like, you know, she was like, yeah, just look for the future and look brighter, whatever. And I continued and then in the end, I got it. but yeah, so I would say that that's, uh, and also something about the, the resume, just one one page maybe two tops not too much and try to write your achievement and your skills in your position so no don't write you know like seven pages uh, resume with a lot of information because it's it's going to be a little more too much it's just just uh, concrete concise brief and the briefer the the better be aware of the types of units you're applying to when you when you send your resume because um if you're applying for a communication position uh and you send a cv that it's clearly based in law you know, it's it's not just try to stress what you have done in communication is very good for that. So I would recommend in my case, I always have that's my rule for Brussels. I have like five, six, seven CVs, depending on the area I want to work in. Um, I know that for a blue book, it seems like, oh, my God, this is too much work. And I understand. But it's good. It increases your possibilities. And also another thing um, just to to <laughs> like your day in case you're stressed about this. It could also happen, uh, happen, which is what happened to me, that you get selected by a unit you haven't lobbied to and you haven't selected. <laughs> so, you know, I never applied to SecGen. I, I, I didn't even know what SecGen was back in the day. Um, and I, I didn't apply. Um, I didn't lobby. It's just that HR found my profile because they were looking for something very specific. And who was my boss called me. Um, so, you know, this could happen too, and this happens a lot more than we think. So don't stress if you see, you know, oh, I have to send 200 emails or not. Just, you know, trust the process, put effort in it, and, and then life will say. <laughs> quite, quite important um, in the sense that, well, in this new process, like, like we said, it is like the first part, which is new like selecting these um, different DGs and the DGs are supposed to um, select the, the ones from those 25, but um, they open the opportunity for the, um, for the wild selection of loving, whatever I could say, which is basically after uh, the first phase of the, of the process, they can select any people who is in the database of the virtual blue book. So take into account, that in that situation, uh, you can lobby as Isabel and Carlos just said. Um, I would say that this would be, in, at least in my experience, I know that we have different experiences here, but in my experience, um, following so many candidates, who um, some JEPSO candidates who went for the, for the Blue Book, um, it's just a quite balance between number of emails that you send and the quality of those emails. Um, when I'm saying quality, I also agree with Isabel and Carlos when they're saying that it doesn't need to be uh, long emails, but you need to express what you can bring to that unit. And you need to dedicate many quality hours to know the different units and what they do. 
and for that, I, I saw that Carlos um, was sharing a link. Uh, it was a very precise one for Rigi, I think. But here, this is the official directory of the European institution, the Who is Who directory. I'm sharing on the on chat. There you can see the organization of almost all the different um, institutions, and you can get a very deep view of the DGs and units on the different um, uh, on the on the on the European Commission. So try to dedicate a lot of time, devote um, quality time to to choose where you want to to work, and send a lot of applications. A very good ones. Um, being said this, I don't know if we, you can finally go through the the interview. How was your interview? What happened in that? What can the people expect from the interviews? Do you want to share your experience? My interview was very random <laughs> because I did not expect a call. First, I did not expect a call at all. Um, I was um, late in the process in the sense that most of my friends had already been contacted and I hadn't. Um, so I just assumed I was not going to be selected. But when I assumed this, I received three, three propositions um, for different services. The one that I went for, which is Segen, um, it was a very nice call, <laughs> I have to say. I mean, the Blue Book is a, is a very light process in the, in the sense that they know what you're going through they know that you're going to be a trainee, you know, so they're not going to do a one hour long interview for you to then be five months with them because that would be an extra stress for you that is not really needed. So in my case, I received a call from my deputy, well, back then deputy head of unit, who was also my supervisor when I started. He told me, we are looking for this profile. We liked your profile because of Da, 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 da. basically it was because I had languages, I had English, and uh, I was, as he said, a uh, general profile, something, yeah, it was like a more general profile, so I was, um, you know, plastic, like I could adapt, um, so he's, he told me, what do you know about EU budgets, uh, <laughs> to which I replied, I have no, no really clue, <laughs> I, I, I studied one of economics uh, I was too honest oh my god I said I just did one course on economics and I you know I studied translation I I know what you do because I was doing a strategic planning and I used that once and uh, but you know if, if you're looking for an economist I'm not and he said well actually we will teach you so no don't panic <laughs> and uh, and and we like you because you have any others like many other skills that go away from economics that are actually we could use um so that was very light it was just you know my availability if i wanted to start right away uh where i was from uh but it was more like chit chat for me not to be nervous i think um and then he told me that has changed that's another thing that has changed because back in the day they just blocked you you know so they selected you blocked you and if you didn't like the position that you were blocked for and you wanted that to change they just rejected you from the blue book trainship that was very bad so they have changed the process so now what you do is that you will receive officially via email um a document that you have to sign saying that you accept that position in that unit and then once you have signed it then hr is going to block you but they cannot block you without you knowing you know so so yeah they blocked me um and that was my interview it was very nice to be honest oh thank you Isabel. carlos in my case was I had I had one call like Isabel mine was on WhatsApp actually because the, the guy didn't want to call me on on Skype he was really nice and he the, the he had three questions the first one was, was like what do you know about the unit so that moment I was like uh, I, I knew just the name and a little bit about the aviation or something and so I said I don't know I began saying I don't know thinking about the green deal or something so he was like no 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 what are we currently working on <laughs> so I was like I honestly don't know. I was like, okay, no problem, but let's continue. So he's just like, we do another Twitter word uh, questions. And he said, um, why, why would you like to work with us? And what could you contribute us with? You know, something like, like that, not really formal. And then I was not, um, I was not selected for that. And then for mine, for the one that I was selected, I didn't have an interview actually. <laughs> I just like, my supervisor told me, because I asked her before this webinar and she said, I just, uh, um, I just uh, selected you because of uh, how responsive you were, how reactive you were with emails. Because I, I had an, I had a problem. I, I applied for a DGT, 
and uh, and I am I did my certificate in administration. So technically, I couldn't really be selected by administration because I was on the on the BGT database. So I basically talked to HR, sent a lot of emails, and then yeah, well in the end, and, and one afternoon I, I sorted it all out, and she really liked that, and she sent me the the, the formal or the PO sent me the formal offer in exec. So it was really it was really surprising, and she said that she liked that. So she said uh, it's a really high quality or here or something like that. So being reactive and responsive. So yeah, my, that was my experience. That's great, Carlos. Thank you very much for all your contributions. We've been here almost two hours already, <laughs> one hour and 48 minutes. Wow, um, this is a little bit crazy. And we have many people here. So um, if you don't mind, we're going to open a Q&A, even that uh, a lot of people already um, sent the, the question and were already answered. So if you want to participate in the Q&A, you need to raise your hand virtually um, so you have a tool here in the bottom it's hand um, we'll give you the floor you can activate your mic and ask the question if if you want to if there are any questions of course okay photos uh, you're the first so uh, the master should be should go on the formal education part if you have a master's degree so you should put it in the formal but I didn't get if you ha if you are going to begin it He's but starting. Carlos, he's starting in October, so no. So no, no. Okay, that's why I didn't. I didn't quite hear. And then the volunteer experience. If you don't have any kind of document, I would say that you should put it in. In perhaps achievements or something like that, or or international experience, but not. I don't know. So what do you think? In in the case um, for the masters that you have started and you don't know where to put. I would put it in other achievements uh, very quickly that you're performing that, that you're enrolled in that. For the associations or youth experiences, you can actually put it in professional experiences um, because that's voluntary work uh, technically. So if you talk to the president or the manager of the association you're in um, and you could you know, ask them to provide you with a certificate that says that you are active on that, uh, then you can put it in professional experience. I mean, it's professional experience. Uh, I, I did two years in total in a youth association as many things, and that was a job. Um, so put it there. Well, um, you have for the opportunity to include ongoing uh, studies. This is something that I don't know if it's if it's new or not. But uh, like Isabel said, um, if you have not going through a lot of your master, maybe even, I don't know if I would include it as, um, as an ongoing qualification because even that uh, it's going to be, well, right now it's, we're in August and you would not start your studies until, until September. So in that case, that would be my, my, my advice. And, in, in any case that you have any doubt about how to um, prove any experience or whatever, uh, I would do the same that uh, Isabel said. Okay, so do not um, get in too much trouble writing too much. Sorry, Isabel. Sorry, I was just going to ask Fotios if, if possible. Um, do, do, are you going to do the trainship as part of your uh, trainship for the studies? That was my case. That's why I'm asking. I would maybe include it if, if it's going to be part time, but it's true that now it's for March, so you will probably be finalizing your master's by then. Maybe you can put it ongoing um, and then just clarify it that you're going to be working part time because um, this is something that could happen because I have seen this. Um, there are people that apply to the Blue Book uh, while they study. But I, my recommendation, without of course getting into your your personal decision, is that uh, the commission is a full job. So be careful with that, um, because you might see yourself under a lot of pressure while studying. So my recommendation is always when people ask me to wait until you finish your studies, because then you can actually, you know, apply and then stay if the possibility, you know, comes, and you know, it's a bit easier. For you also to go into the process of cast and the rest of exams is, is easier to prove um, that you have finalized the masters, but we are going into a different direction there. We have some examples of people who were uh, studying a master during the internships, which are not too many because this is something exceptional. 
um, the experiences were not too good because they could not socialize. Uh, it was quite difficult to well, to do both of them uh, simultaneously. So yeah, that, that, that is a very good advice. In fact, uh, I also wanted to say that um, in our YouTube channel, uh, we have Tell More About You, which is like an initiative um, to show other people, other people experiences on the Blue Book, Schumann, in fact, Carlos is in Tell Me More About You, and Isabel will be soon there. But um, what I want to say is that we have those experiences and many of the videos are already with subtitles in English. So I want, in case you want to follow them, that, that will be nice. And of course, if you want to subscribe, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, something that uh, you can do. Hey, Carlos. Just briefly, uh, playing the, de the, the devil's advocate, I finished my second bachelor while doing the traineeship. So I had my exams in, in, in April, and so I finished in May. So it, it, it's difficult, but it's possible. I mean, if you, I, mean I, I didn't have any choice. I mean, I was already enrolled in, and I knew about the traineeship later, so I couldn't really, you know, but yeah, just to motivate people who, I don't know. Okay, um, we have another question here, Enrique. In this case, I don't have a super final answer because in, in my opinion, it's not that important, but um, I would put the ones in your certificate because it's the ones they are going to see. They don't really know when you finished, you know? So they are, they, the only proof they have is your, your diploma. So if the diploma is, you know, uh, signed and, and sealed on September, just say September, it's, it's easier for you. Um, for your second question, uh, no, it's 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 like the solidarity course is something actually we love. <laughs> we love when people do that, uh, but it's not it's not saying as as something done in institutions at all because I mean you you have experiences from two weeks into one year huh, for that. So no 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 no, but put it in in professional experience. It's it's great. Okay, uh, Solen. Hey everyone. Yeah. Um. So there are a couple of questions in YouTube. So. If it is, it is enough to have attended a master's degree in English, for example, just to demonstrate a C2 level in the language. So if you have not obtained a language certificate. Uh, Carlos, do you want to go ahead? You are the expert in language. It's a, it's a, it's a, bit, it's a bit tricky, but it uh, depends on the, on the degree. But if the degree has been fully taught in English, then you can put that, that, that you have a, a proficient level. I, I am not sure about the C2 part. I don't know about Isabel, but I would be I would play safe and just put um, uh, C1. Although it's true that if it's if it if it has been completely taught in English and in the U.S. or Australia or something, of course it's a, it's a C2. But I I, I don't know. I, I I would I would put a C1 and and that way it's a proficient level. But I'm not exaggerated. But I don't know. What would you say, Isabel? The same. Yeah. No. Don't yeah. never put C2. Um, because the thing with languages is that if you if you're not humble you know what i mean it seems like it's fake because c2 is very difficult i mean i have studied my degree in english entirely and my second master for example was in french and in english and i didn't have a c1 in french not even so you know it, one needs to be humble because then they're going to see okay c2 okay can, how can you prove that um so always go with c1 i mean that's that's the basis they are going to accept you everyone has that level so c1 is very good i would go for that one do you have another question is that... i do so this is the final one that we have on our youtube channel it's about if they give some kind of extra period of time to obtain certificates that we have not received yet yeah that happened to me actually um you can go in in the case of spain um the vicerector <laughs> or the rector have the power to say that you have finalized your degree um so it's actually an official document they give you when you have paid for the the the, the diploma but the diploma hasn't arrived so see if that is an option in your university because in mine it was like i paid for my diploma and then they handed it this to me you know signed by the university proven by the university and everything and and done by the by the rector which is you know like the director in that sense so but it it cannot be you know approve of one of your professors just saying that you did it no in that case no okay thank you very much Isabel. thank you very much carlos
Thank you, Solène, for, for everything. Uh, we are going to finish here because it's been such a long time already. Thank you so much for the patience. Thank you so much also for all the time that you have devoted to prepare this workshop because it seems like we have been talking for the last two hours, but we had already a couple meetings. We had a lot of time to, to prepare for being here today to get to know the what's new uh, in this new process. So thank you so much for, for everything. It's been really, really nice to have you here and to uh, share all your experiences. So let's see, let's hope that many people are successful candidates soon and that uh, they can tell us. I don't know if you want to say anything else, um, final tip or just say whatever. <laughs> Believe in yourself and don't stop. Don't stop. Doesn't matter what what um, target you have. Yeah, I know. In my case, just uh, good luck, guys. Uh, it's going to it's going to be difficult. I'm not going to lie, but it's very very worth it. You're going to meet lots of people, and you're going to love the city. So you know, if any of you come to Brussels and want to go for a coffee, just uh, call us or to Luxembourg, I guess. <laughs> just call us, and if you have doubts, just contact us. You know, you have our names. You can look for us in LinkedIn and things like that. Um, but yeah, good luck with everything. Yeah, we keep in touch, everybody. Have a nice end of the day, and we will see each other soon. Bye bye. <laughs>